Discover Next, the studio for facades and design. Next is the platform for innovation in the field of building envelopes, for inspiration, information and communication. Initiated by Vicona, with leading industry experts as Next partners. Next is a unique concept which is constantly evolving and bringing the future of cities to life. Dear ladies and gentlemen, it's a pleasure to welcome you here from our Next Studio in Frankfurt. Next Studio by Vicona and Partners is proudly to present the Next Facade Summit here live from Frankfurt in Germany. We have some in our audience who will present a little bit later, but more important is the topic, the theme of the, day, the evening, the day, and as Christoph Tim is uh, just joining in from New York in the morning, uh, to really join in and to really go into that kind of theme and topic. It is think globally, but build locally. Why is it this topic? Because we have a lot of experts of the industry here to give us a little bit their understanding about opportunities, requirements, and to some extent, you might also face pitfalls when you go for these international and global projects. When you come to this kind of international global curtain wall projects, we have a lot of topics to consider. We have multi-local activities, we have multicultural activities. Multi-local means different regulations, different standards to be fulfilled. Multicultural, we all are of different natures, of different cultures. Our common denominator is the English language, and as you can just understand yourself, it is not always the same native speaker in front of you. So unless we have to really understand one, when we have this kind of understanding, when we speak, what we mean, is the other one receiving what we mean, or is it just understanding what we speak? And I'm so proud and happy to have really five of the experts of our industry with us. Coming from Stuttgart, we have Knippersen Helbing, we have Werner Sobeck AG with Professor Blandini, we have Dark Architecture from Oslo presenting us their sustainable way forward into this kind of arena. We have Lisa with us coming more or less into the studio. She's normally in Los Angeles in London, but she's grounded in Germany these days. So she is coming to give us a speech here from Eckersley O'Callaghan EOC in brief. And I'm proud to start with one of, I would say, the longest fellows we have uh, joined in in our building construction industry it is Christoph Tim. Christoph is live in New York, grounded in his home office. I mean, we all just suffer from the pandemic these days. But it's really great to have you in, Christoph. And of course, I tried to Google a little bit. I mean, all the speakers, I tried to Google a little bit during the weekend. What is specific? I myself, I have just uh, taken some notes. I mean, you're senior director of uh, Skidma Owens and Merrill, SOM in brief. I mean, it's for me one of the most experienced, the oldest, maybe even the biggest architectural engineering company in the world. Uh, we have also seen that your daily business is also linked to a senior leadership of the SOM Enclosure Group. And you did some remarkable works in the recent past. And uh, I, I just tried to pronounce it right with my German accent. One of the most famous icons, at least I can really monitor and to say it like that, is One World Trade Center New York. And I just want to pronounce it One World Trade Center New York. And also among other activities, I've seen the North Carolina um, Museum of Art, which is also remarkable. And finally, maybe we'll get a little bit into this as well. It's the Air Force Academy in, uh, in Colorado Springs, which is definitely something you have shown us uh, uh, a little more, more details. But Christoph, tell me something. Is this all or is there something special in SOM? You're just working these days and you want to give us this exciting news. Christoph. Uh, good to be here with you, Werner. Thank you very much for the invitation. Good to be here with the commu your community here. Um, yes, uh, I'm super excited. We are, we are actually uh, reaching for the stars these days. Uh, we are working um, actively on a project on the moon. It's called the Moon Village, and um, it's about permanent habitation of mankind on the moon. And uh, we believe it's going to happen uh, in the very, very near future that, that we will have... Um, uh, a multinational effort 
to have people living on mm -hmm. the moon in the near mm -hmm. future, within the next 10, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Is, is anything, because we are all a little bit grounded, I mean, we are all here together and we are we're really happy to see real people. I mean, you're grounded at the moment in the office in New York. Is, is anything you, you would say, at least something not as worse as uh, COVID has brought us, is it something positive you and your daily work can experience these days? Absolutely. I think we, I mean, we as SOM, we are globally operating with multiple uh, offices around the world, I'm mm. sure. Uh, some of your community members have, this, have, a, have a similar setup. And we've seen an, a, an intense collaboration now between our offices. Mm -hmm. So what used to be like teams that were stationed, let's say, in Chicago or L.A. or New York, these teams were more or less isolated. Not anymore. We are, we are constantly communicating with Zoom and having exchanges of, of personnel between uh, teams. So th mm -hmm. that definitely uh, um, is a good... Um, it's a, it was a good um, development, uh, you may say, with the COVID-19 and exactly. the work from home yeah, environment. Yeah, yeah. And I also know that you're just working also on projects in India. I've, I've also read about South Korea and China and, of course, in the US. And this is definitely something that you spread the world by this kind of communication means, I guess. Oh, absolutely. Like, like I say, it's a, the, the trick is really to have the means at your fingertips, whether it's Zoom or Slack or all these other new platforms. Mm -hmm that are evolving, which is, which is terrific to, uh, to, um, to, be, to be able to use them these days. And, uh, and I, I cannot give enough credit to our IT department or on all the other IT departments yeah. uh, of, of big companies, because without that, we would be absolutely isolated. Our business would be in, in real trouble. But uh, with the IT of 2020, it's, it's, it's manageable. Yeah. That, that's remarkable. And, and you just realize, I mean, we are, we are just perfect when it comes to the broadcasting from New York now into Frankfurt studio. But honestly, we had not been so bold for that event. Uh, so we really tried to get something in advance. So Christoph, thank you so much. Uh, you, you have taken a, a, a video by yourself uh, with your team in New York. And we will now just go through your presentation, which is more or less that kind of video. And uh, it is definitely something you should uh, stay and, and focus and do it like that. Christoph, some, some words to the audience out there, straight from New York, before we start the video. Um, well, um, hang in there. It is a tough time for a lot of people. And be thankful for, for what you have. And um, so that's, that's, that's not really architectural uh, mm -hmm. focused. It's just a general comment. Stay strong. These are, these are very, very difficult times. And, uh, and uh, it's good to have a job and it's good to work on interesting projects. Mm -hmm and just um, blind us on and keep doing the good stuff that you're doing. And, uh, and uh, I'm sure there's gonna be a light at the end of the tunnel. And um, we get stronger out of this, I believe. And um, enjoy the presentation. Thank you so much, Christoph. And have a great day in New York. See you then. Bye. To start this presentation, a few words about SOM. Skidmore, Owings and Merrill was founded in the 1930s by two gentlemen, Skidmo and Owings, two architects. Soon after the found, founding of the company, they were joined by Mr. Merrill, who is an engineer. And this DNA of collaboration between architects and engineers and other disciplines has stayed within the DNA of the firm up until today. So within the last uh, eight decades, we have uh, worked on about more than 10,000 projects worldwide. Uh, we have worked on some of the most recognized buildings of the 20th and 21st century and um, representing some of those, uh, all of this uh, body of work. Uh, I put three on the screen here, uh, very recognizable. The World Trade Center here in Manhattan, One World Trade, uh, the Burj Khalifa in Dubai and uh, the um, T2 terminal in Mumbai, India. The company maintains offices around the world. We have about uh, 1,200 people worldwide. Uh, in New York City, where I'm based, we have about 350, 360 people currently. And um, before I talk about um, the actual project work, uh, in our pre-presentation uh, chat here, we were discussing that maybe it's a nice idea to talk about uh, what's going on in uh, New York City right now. And so I wanted to share a few thoughts and uh, impressions here from the city. 
and what's going on here on the street of uh, Manhattan these days. Um, the pandemic is in full swing, of course, here it continues to be really limiting our life. Uh, the city generally feels pretty empty. Uh, masks are pretty much in Manhattan worn everywhere, pretty much. You go to the outer boroughs, it's a little bit less, I would think, unfortunately. Um, uh, when you go to stores, you have to wear a mask. Uh, inside spaces, usually uh, you have to wear masks, otherwise you can't go in. We've had over the summer, some, as you, you're you probably very well aware of, some uh, social justice issues here in the United States, and, and uh, we felt the protests here too. And uh, I would have never expected to have, see a burned out police car on Broadway uh, here right in front of Bloomingdale's and in, uh, in uh, Soho and uh, boarded up uh, retail stores everywhere. So it's been, it's been a very eventful and very intense uh, few months, nine months now, also with the election. Um, when it comes to construction sites, thanks goodness construction sites are open. Uh, typically when you go there, you have to get your temperature taken. You, you have an oxygen, a blood, blood oxygen test, and then you get a little band here like you see here. Uh, public schools are also open, uh, also closed now, I have to say, again, after they were originally open in September, now they are closed. Uh, it remains to be seen how long. Uh, walking around downtown, it's uh, it's pretty um, it's a pretty bleak uh, picture if you really look closely. There's a lot of stores, very well established stores that are closing or have closed. For example, Century Twenty One here downtown, huge department store is is going out of business. Modals uh, is going out of business downtown. My favorite pastry shop here, a French pastry shop at the corner, is, is, has closed. Restaurants are being sold and uh, closing. It's, um, you can clearly see the city is suffering. Uh, and it's kind of weird to see the stock market uh, hit the 30,000 mark uh, just recently. Um, uh, restaurants, um, what we've been seeing in the last uh, few months uh, since the summer, uh, they have been allowed to have outside um, seating capacities uh, on the street actually instead of uh, parking car parking they they are allowed to have little um, structures built here as you can see some examples and that's actually quite nice the the street life has significantly improved i would say significantly uh, more activity on the street almost more like a, a european feel uh, here and there uh, so much life on the street almost like a new orleans also um, so that's been that's been great on one hand, um, the limiting issue for the restaurants, of course, is the inside seating is 25% capacity only. So they are also hurting um, quite a bit, I believe. And so we, we'll we see how, how this uh, all uh, develops now with the colder weather coming and um, maybe not so many people taking this um, uh, this opportunity of, of dining outside. When it comes to the workforce or work life, um, and SOM has globally been pretty much for the most of it working from home since March, mid-March. Uh, recently here in, in New York, we, we have had some people, about 10% of the workforce, uh, return to work. Um, but you can see here uh, at the picture on the top right that it's pretty empty uh, seating to uh, maintain the social distancing um, in place. Um, this is really unfortunate. It's a brand new office for us in uh, one of our towers that we designed uh, uh, right after 9-11, Tower 7 here at the World Trade Center. Um, but for now, we remain to be pretty much uh, operating on, on Zoom with Zoom meetings and Slack and uh, platforms like that. And there's no plan at this point to, to, to bring back the entire workforce uh, uh, anytime soon. So for some time, I've been thinking about a presentation like, um, like the one I've been about to give here. Uh, it's about materiality and, uh, and some projects where we take uh, great care in selecting materials that we work with and do not cover up the materials. What do I mean by this? It's like, for example, uh, not to use an aluminum sheet on extrusion that is being painted but maybe use stainless steel, bronze, brass, a material that may age. Um, materials like stone, look at the finishing of uh, stone and what can be done to make it an interesting, specifically interesting 
uh, material or also architectural concrete um, on a facade, for example, uh, and then detail this very, very carefully. And so, so the following presentation is about three projects that, uh, that are under construction right now or just finished, where, we, where I want to give a little bit of an inside view of, of, uh, of what we are doing and what one could maybe call a trend or at least a consideration to do this kind of uh, more careful uh, design with, with material or honest material. Um, so please enjoy. First, I will talk about stone on a hotel project here in the city, then a stainless steel facade for a museum close by Washington DC. And last, I want to talk about a commercial project here in the city that utilizes uh, architectural cast in place concrete. So three examples for modern facades that all kind of like follow this approach of like carefully designing with materials. Manhattan West is situated in uh, Midtown Manhattan, pretty much uh, between um, the Empire State Building that you can see in the, in the axon here towards the right and the Hudson River. Um, you can, in between, you can also see uh, Penn Station, Madison Square Garden, and then you see this development here that is, is all new reclaimed land, basically, built over existing railroad tracks that, that were covered up with a plank system. And, um, and now this new real estate has been uh, built upon. SOM was master planning this effort. We uh, were in charge of uh, four projects uh, on this site uh, designed by SOM. And the one I would like to talk about today is, is here the Pandry that you can see. Uh, it's, a, it's a rather smaller project. Uh, it's a hotel has 21 stories, has a unitized curtain wall uh, facade. And um, there was an emphasis, emphasis specifically on uh, coming up with a design that would, um, would draw attention by its careful de detailing uh, because the, the sheer size is not, it's not so big. But uh, we thought uh, for a smaller project like this, it would be very appropriate to come up with a very interesting scheme for the facade and, and spent the time uh, carefully detailing this. Um, so you see the site plan here, the red building is the Pandry, um, and this is the entire area of uh, Manhattan West. Um, the new plaza that you can see here is, is open by now. Most of the buildings, uh, uh, well, are, all of the buildings are under construction or are already uh, all finished and occup partially occupied or fully occupied. The idea um, that we had was the bay window concept that has been uh, utilized for quite some time now. Um, what you see on the right side is inspiration that we got from uh, um, William Le Baron's uh, Manhattan building in Chicago. It, to this very day, this building is there. It, uh, it has, has this be these beautiful bay windows and we thought it would be pretty interesting to to pick this up and to make a building that has that is composed of a lot of bay windows um, for a boutique hotel we thought that that would be an appropriate approach for the facade you can see here uh, again the the vicinity to um, to important sites here you can see in the background uh, the empire state building and we believe that uh, that these bay windows give the occupant, the, the traveler, a nice engaging way to, to see the city, the surroundings um, that, that, that he's uh, staying in. A floor plan here, each one has 11 keys, 11 uh, rooms. There's one, one bedroom suite at the corner, also in the top left, you can see. You can see the shape of the building is, uh, is basically a rectangular, uh, about 25 meters uh, front um, coverage here and the side is about 35. Um, the bay windows that I've talked about are on the north side and on the south side, which are the primary um, exposures of this facade. Developing the geometry, of course, uh, was an effort to, to rational, rationalize 
And uh, in the very end, we were able to come up with a design that fit the constraints, the site constraints, with only three different radii. And that was, of course, very important for, um, for uh, the fabrication of the building or the production of the cur unitized curtain wall. Overall, the building has about 50% window to wall ratio. So it does appear like a, a very glassy building, but uh, when you do the math, it is, it's rather um, not closed, but it's, uh, it's only 50% open. So it's um, uh, important to come up also like with an idea of how you can uh, hide these, um, these opaque zones. And therefore we, um, we have learned in the past, you know, it's always a good idea to utilize dark glass to hide, um, hide, uh, hide certainly like bathrooms and, and other spaces that you don't want to have um, and you don't need to have uh, vision glazing. So we knew from the get, we knew from the get go that that black glass or darkened glass would be a, a good concept, especially also like when it comes to like selecting the coating for the glass that that we need to have, especially when you have a, a convex and concave uh, glass geometry. That is always an issue of like. Uh, jumping the coding from the let's say the number two number three for production uh, reasons and so what we came up with here uh, was the uh, was was a, a a tinted glass on the outer for the outer light and the coding basically on the number two surface uh, always on the um, convex side of the bent glass and and therefore uh, we didn't have any issue any, any production issues with uh, making the glass the curved glass to highlight the wave geometry of the facade, um, we introduced uh, ribbons in the, in the dark color that you can see here on the on the picture. Uh, this um, the simple and elegant perimeter layout also satisfied the design's keen interest in creating a memorable experience at the top of the building. You can see this uh, this wave is is quite uh, um, quite impressive, I think, at the top where the building meets the sky. Uh, and this is especially. Uh, important in the context of New York, where like the crown, the top of the building is always uh, something that architects very, very carefully look at. These uh, spandrel ribbons that I just talked about um, were uh, carefully explored. And in the end, we settled with natural stone. Uh, that was perceived as a rich material on the facade and much better than, for example, um, an all glass facade having a glass ribbon uh, or pacified maybe or metal ribbon uh, painted uh, or even like a high performance concrete. We, uh, we had a lot of samples made, but ultimately we settled on uh, the natural stone and uh, especially as it was so rich in its, um, in its beauty. And, uh, and we were able to work with it and introduce some recessed surfaces that were eventually then um, that would have a different uh, look than uh, than than the prime surfaces that uh, was flame finished, and I wanted to spend some time to to walk you through about the uh, production of the stone because I thought this was was really really interesting to learn about stone uh, for unitized curtain wall. So the base stone is a is the is a crystal black from La Croix in uh, Quebec in Canada. So after it's quarried, it gets um, it gets cut in these gigantic um, uh, blocks, uh, or it gets gets quarried in gigantic blocks and then cut into smaller pieces that uh, that were then flame finished and with a CNC wire cutter they were sliced off these relatively small slabs and uh, so it was a very material efficient uh, uh, production. Then it was cut to size uh, with these all these CNC machines and you can see there's there's hardly a person there. Um, so it's a very automated process. Uh, these grooves that I alluded to or spoke about uh, are introduced. And then the whole, the whole uh, uh, stone sample is, is run through a water jetting machine. And that uh, in the softer material of the flame finish is being uh, uh, washed away basically. And it reveals uh, the stone's specular min minerals. It makes it sparkle more. And that you can see nicely in this detail here, the reveal, the reveal is, is darker and a little bit more matte, while the, the protruding surfaces are flame finished and, and it exposed the minerals nicely and it sparkles great in the sun. So very careful detailing that makes this a very, very rich um, material here. 
uh, everything is QC'd. And then uh, we, of course, did a dry lay to make sure that there's no uh, outliers here, that, uh, that, the, that the stone is in its natural beauty uh, within, um, within a, a certain spectrum and not, not too many like outliers, like darker or lighter panels. So we always, we always try to do this um, dry lay. Then uh, the stone is shipped to the curtain wall uh, manufacturer and it's um, put into the units. A few words about the detailing. It's, it's pretty straightforward uh, unitized American curtain wall system. You can see two plan details here uh, on the left, the vision zone uh, as it turns into a, a shadow box zone uh, on the left and on the right is just a, a plan detail cut at the anchor. Uh, you can see the male, female um, mullion. Um, a section detail here at the stack joint on the left. And with our geometry that we had, we had very tight uh, radii, about uh, close to 1.5 meters radii. Come to some issues when it comes to um, bending aluminum also. Not, it's not just the glass you have to look at, it's also the bending of the aluminum. And uh, so you can, at the top right here, you see uh, one of the first tries and you can see also like uh, the waviness of the extruded uh, bent aluminum. Uh, on the bottom picture, you can see on the left, again, the first try, and you can see also like the, the surface imperfections uh, kind of following, the, following the, the verticals in the extrusion, and which was, of, of, of course, objection, objectionable. And, um, and then on the right, uh, the final uh, process where we sanded it down and, uh, and, and used a slightly more sophisticated bending technology. Uh, to get this effect uh, that you can see on the right. So it's a very smooth surface. It looks very much like the straight aluminum uh, transoms on the inside. The project was uh, delivered in a design assist methodology. That is a standard here in New York City these days. Uh, almost like that projects don't go through a design bit build process uh, anymore where uh, 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 and a, a contract is awarded after a final design. That that's, it does happen, but it's, it's rather rare. Oftentimes projects get awarded uh, um, earlier. Uh, and in this case, uh, as part of the design assist, we, uh, we typically the contractor and the owner and the architect agree on, on the, the typical details uh, prior to the uh, contract award. But after award, then we, uh, we work together and solve all the, all the very tricky details um, together. We ran through a typical uh, schedule like we had visual mockups for proof of concept. Uh, we mocked up entire room to get an idea about this um, about this bay window. Uh, typical uh, performance mockup testing. Then uh, a few shots about the installation here on site. Very tight quarters, uh, and we used a, a Jacko Mini Spider Crane here to install the units. Um, And here you can see the distinctive silhouette uh, talked about at the top of the building as it meets the sky, the glass uh, beautifully hiding all the opacified areas uh, to the most part here during daytime at least. Uh, and the, the ribbons, the, stone, the beautiful stone ribbons really emphasize uh, the facade geometry. So this was an example for the use of carefully designed and produced stone in a unitized curtain wall. And up next, um, uh, a project that utilizes simple stainless steel for cladding, also in a very carefully designed manner. This is the National Museum of the United States Army, which is uh, located about 20 miles outside of Washington, D.C., in a park-like setting on top of a slight hill. It just opened on Veterans Day about two weeks ago, and it's the first national museum about the history of the army, its values and the service of the 30 million men and women who have served in the oldest branch of the US military. It's about 187,000 square, square feet, which is 17,000 square meters. And SOM was responsible for the architecture as well as the structural engineering, as well as the mechanical engineering on this project. In general, the exhibitions are focusing uh, not on the battles or the wars, but on the individual soldier. Um, it's a century-long narrative of honor, sacrifice, and valor. At the facade, 
The building is clad into stainless steel panels that softly reflect the landscape surroundings and it's transforming the building, uh, building's character throughout the day and the season. The museum is designed as a, as a series of pavilions, uh, as a composition, uh, individual pavilions that, uh, that rise up to about 30 meters in height, 100 feet. And these uh, pavilions are joined uh, what we call connectors uh, that are glass clad and allow for framed views into landscape. So this is a, the nice contrast between these opaque metal clad um, uh, pavilions and then, uh, and then these uh, connectors. So we played up this contrast and, and we framed the views uh, at the connectors into the landscape with these, uh, with these, tight, with these tight connecting pieces, volumes, uh, making it uh, very interesting from an architectural standpoint. You can see this uh, in the plan here again. Uh, here's the big exhibition space, and these are the little connector parts that I'm just uh, I just talked about, and they allow for nice frame views into the landscape. Um, when you look at the elevation, uh, you begin to see this this rigorous gridded facade that we think is is so uh, um, uh, appropriate for uh, a military museum. Uh, typically, the entire facade is gridded into a three-foot stainless steel panel, and when it comes to the glass enclosure, most of the time it is uh, it is gridded down into 18 inches, which is half of it. So one meter, three feet is about a little bit less than a meter. Um, these uh, long stainless steel panels, up to 20 feet long, about uh, a little bit more than six meters. Um, so you begin to, if you look at the elevation, you begin to see the importance of grid and you can somehow you can you can almost compare it to like a, an Agnes Martin painting uh, which is all about grid and rigor and so is this museum and a few examples here of uh, how this looks like now you can see beautifully executed these uh, these joint lines and how the metal panels uh, transition into glass and back uh, very nicely done uh, the cladding, the stainless steel cladding is a, is a very, very simple enclosure assembly. You can see the, uh, the fireproof st uh, structural steel. You can see the stud wall with some insulation on the inside, the sheathing, then the air barrier, insulation, uh, a slight air gap, and then the stainless steel assembly on the outside. And um, when it comes to the corner, it's always like uh, uh, the architect's greatest challenge. How do you turn the corner with, uh, with material? Um, where do you place the grid? So in this case, uh, the, the enclosure facade is always on the grid, on our, 30, on our three foot grid, 36 inches grid. And, uh, and one side of the facade wins over the other. You can see that here. In this case, the horizontal wins over the vertical here uh, in this plan detail. Uh, and, and this is important because at the corner, as I mentioned, you have these, um, these glass and glass windows uh, in the pavilions. And so to illustrate this, sometimes you have the former detail that I just show, showed with this detail, the glass detail just on top of each other. And you can see again, how the, how the, um, how the glass enclosure, how the um, metal enclosure hits, hits the, the grid of the building. And then when you look at the, this executed, you can see what, what I was just talking about. So it all comes together and that, that nice metal panel travels all the way up. Uh, very, very carefully designed these, uh, these details. Uh, a shot of the uh, building under construction, you can see at the bottom already the stainless steel panel is installed here. Um, and behind here, you can see the, the insulation, how it's held on these horizontal um, break formed metals clips. And now the building is finished. Again, you can see the soft lighting that you get and the soft reflectivity of the landscape surroundings in here. Uh, primary uh, material on the facade is this stainless steel, which is uh, stainless steel 316. I think it compares pretty similar to a, a Werk in Germany, a Werkstoff Nummer 1.4401 as an alloy. It is, um, it's a particularly high resisting uh, alloy to pitting and uh, crevice corrosion. And so then this is why it was selected. We added uh, a nice, very soft number six long grain brushed finish to it. And this 
uh, of course, in contrast to the very, ref not very, but to the slightly reflective glazing that we have, about 30% is this uh, low iron glass uh, on the building. Um, a few details here, uh, illustrating again the care that we took. This is a door detail, very simple a hollow metal door, and it's also clad in the same stainless steel as the surrounding um, fixed panels. Here, a picture of that door. You can see how the hardware has only this little cutout and these joints are almost, per yeah, you can say perfectly executed. Beautiful, about 12 millimeters in, in dimension. So overall, uh, this stainless steel is, uh, has a super low maintenance uh, requirement. So it's, uh, it's very cost efficient in its uh, upkeep. Um, the, we, and we believe that this uh, beautifully, uh, rigorously designed building, the composition of it is highly appropriate for, for a, a military institution like this uh, army museum. Now we've covered stone and stainless steel as a material for the facade. And the last project that I want to talk about uses concrete for its superstructure and at the same time also exposes this very concrete at the facade as architectural concrete. 1245 Broadway is a 23-story boutique office building that is under construction in New York City uh, right now. And we, uh, we will be opening this uh, project uh, next year, 2021. SOM is responsible for the architecture. And it's a building where the superstructural material cast in place concrete also manifests itself on the facade. It's broken, thermally broken at the slabs for, for thermal reasons. And what you can see here on the left is a tiny little blow up of a corner uh, here on the big building. And you can see how carefully this uh, um, in situ concrete is detailed. Um, and that's what we're going to talk about. The massing of the building, as you can see, steps back from uh, Broadway, which is uh, right here. This is Broadway and this is 31st Street. It steps back uh, as of rights per the zoning regulations in New York City. The project is located uh, in the so-called Nomad neighborhood. Uh, it's just uh, south of 34th Street. 34th Street is over here. This is Broadway. So it's situated on Broadway and 31st Street. Um, the circles here illustrate um, walking distances for a two minute walk and for a five minute walk. So you can see within five minutes, we can reach uh, Penn Station at Madison Square Garden over here. Uh, you can see the Empire State Building over there. And within uh, no time, you can reach about uh, 13 subway stations. So it's a, it's a pretty, uh, pretty well connected uh, area that has seen tremendous developments uh, in, the, in the last year or two. Uh, a blow up here on the left hand side of the site, there's two primary facades on the 31st Street over here and on Broadway over there. And we're going to talk about how the facade reacts to these uh, two primary um, exposures in a second. We talked about uh, the, the setbacks already a little bit. Uh, the massing of this tower riffs on the traditional wedding cake uh, in New York City that you see a lot, again, based upon the, the zoning regulations uh, for lighting. And so these setbacks kind of dance up uh, the building and they give great opportunities for the tenants uh, for outside space. So that is, that is also a trend that we're seeing in the industry, in construction industry, real estate. Uh, terraces, uh, a few years ago, nobody was willing to uh, spend uh, money on terraces. Nowadays, that, that is uh, an amenity that is highly uh, valued. And so we do more and more buildings with these, um, with these outside spaces, terraces. Um, the concrete facade is pretty bold. It's uh, very bold uh, lines here. And if you look closely, you can see the concrete uh, columns here cladding. You can see them relatively wide. And as the building goes up, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower, kind of reflecting the forces that uh, decrease as you go up in the building. Um, Infilling the, the concrete structure are these gigantic modular uh, unitized floor to ceiling picture windows. They are composed of two, uh, two units, basically each opening that, that slide together. This was uh, designed as per the requirements of the hoist, the elevator, and the way they would be installed. And also like how the panels would be uh, brought to site. 
this way we were limiting the width and to make it easier to bring them into the into the into the um, building uh, the immediate surroundings of 1241 embody uh, the distinct architectural character of of the broader broader area um, it's a smattering of historically landmarked structure such as the grand hotel and the empire state building um, mingled with other contemporary additions to create an uh, one can say an, an eclectic truly manhattan urban fabric so this concrete uh, approach was uh, was a direct uh, response to this uh, to this eclectic uh, neighbor neighborhood uh, we were trying to purposefully avoid the all glass tower so 1245 kind of nodes instead to the character of some of its more historic neighbors whose facades uh, um, frame the glass windows with beautiful uh, proportion of stone and concrete details. Just some uh, dimensional dimensions here. Typical floor to floor height is about uh, 14 feet, 4.2 meters. And the clear opening of, this, uh, of the windows are about uh, 3.5 meters in height. Uh, the glass is triple glazed windows that eliminate actually the, the radiator requirements. So, People can step up all the way to the facade here nicely and look outside. Uh, also, it brings down uh, brings down the acoustics or it helps with the acoustic performance of the facade. But to make a concrete structure like this, we knew that this was going to be a challenge. How to make this really beautiful in the city? And so the first step that we took was uh, was we uh, we went on a concrete crawl. We call it. And we visited a series of, of projects that we know of here in the city that were executed recently. And we visited them and we tried to learn and make our opinion about, uh, create a form an opinion of what, what we think is um, a good concrete, what's not so good at concrete. Um, and then we put, put all this knowledge that we gathered into our specification and called for a lot of uh, sampling. First little samples were like square foot by square, square foot samples. And we learned very quickly that, that there's only very limited uh, color basically that you learn and that you can't like evaluate unless you wait. So at the top, you see the concrete just being stripped. And then you can see at the bottom image how it changed colors uh, once we waited. So we, we learned that, that with concrete, you always have to wait to make a really final determination. We went a slightly bigger then. We created these tombstones. Uh, again, we learned a little bit, but not that much, because because we realized that you need to have the right form liners uh, that we needed for creating these shapes, these special designed column shapes. However, we also like mocked up the the tie holes, and we picked a tie hole here. You can see in the picture we picked this kind of design for the tie hole. So every mockup we learned something and moved on. Uh, the third phase was um, was some concrete columns that we poured with um, with the concrete liners in place. And uh, we, there was clearly an evol evolution of, of skills of the contractor. Uh, and uh, from the back here to the front, it got better and better, less, less, uh, less problems. And so we learned again um, with, uh, with these, um, with these mock-ups. We went then as a, ne as a next step to the, to the tallest column that we have at the arcade at the bottom, uh, up to 22 feet tall. Um, and we mocked that up and, and just to test how, how the formwork would behave. And, and again, we learned uh, very valuable information. So this is, I think, the way to do it uh, on any exposed co architectural concrete uh, structure, which is extremely complicated to pull off beautifully. What, what, what we learned, we put into a bigger size mock-up. Uh, we mocked up the corner, we mocked up all the important details and used that, uh, that corner mock-up uh, also, for a performance mock-up of the glass enclosure, we did uh, some air, air and water testing and um, structural testing. And um, if you look closely, you can see that the concrete uh, columns are slightly shaped differently, whether it's on the Broadway side or the street side. Um, and so this is uh, a little bit uh, the, the fine detailing that this project really uh, exposes here nicely. So on the left, you see uh, the a concrete column, structural concrete column on the Broadway side. On the right side, you can see this the same column, but with a different shape on the street side. So one is a rectangle, one is a parallelogram that, uh, that really plays with, these, uh, with this angle of Broadway 
cutting through the Manhattan grid. Um, this is also like uh, manifested in the in the aluminum in aluminum window mullion design. You can see on the left again, Broadway side. You can see the uh, the vertical mullions being shaped parallelogram shape, and then on the right side you can see the rectangular shaped um, mullions on the street side. So this brings us to the end of this lectures about the one potential trend we are seeing in the facade industry and the facade design, the use of carefully designed but uncoated materials. Although we just explored uh, in this talk granite, stainless steel, and architecturally exposed concrete, there are also other projects currently uh, being worked on at SOM that pursue this very approach also with other materials. Thank you very much for listening in. I hope this was a, a little bit of uh, food for thought. And with that, back to Werner. Great. Thank you so much, Christoph. And it's a pleasure to get more or less the live stream. And we have a little bit waited whether we really everything is finished. So welcome back. And uh, definitely we go ahead now with the next four speakers. And the next one is from Knippers Helbig. Um, it's Roman Schieber. And I also, of course, try to find a little bit some, some hidden sites of uh, his uh, existence. So I, I went into Google as always. Um, the one thing is not so prominent. I mean, it's of course he's part of the directory board of Clippers Helving. He's associate director. He also has a degree in architecture and I also read he's certified facade engineer. And uh, I met him, I would say, for the first time some weeks ago and I thought it was for the first time, but then we, we came across a story where we have uh, common links. Um, I tortured him during his time as facade engineer with building physics. Um, and this is a great combination and he loved building physics, of course, and this is the reason why he came here uh, to celebrate building physics in his uh, speech. No, this is not stay in, it will not be about building physics. Um, in addition, uh, what is remarkable, Roman uh, has two jobs. He is responsible for the facade team in New York and in Stuttgart. And uh, Roman, just, just come in, because I also Googled something and came across uh, a seminar, Sack World of Facades, and I have to make the citation, because it's, it's the first person I have ever read on the internet who was presented in his first decade. Roman made his jobs in Asia. I mean, most of you might know more or less that he was part of the Boa An International Airport, Masilmeano Fuxas was uh, the architect, is the architect here, and it's a one kilometer long, it's not a skyscraper, it's a ground scraper. And in addition, for the Expo 2010 in Shanghai, he was also part of the main axis, 0.7 kilometers uh, just along, I mean, so it's the cupola activities. And then the citation goes ahead, Sack World of Facades, I like that citation, his second decade of his career, he spent in USA. And uh, he will really give us some interesting speeches, I hope at least, uh, for a specific project. It's called the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, where you have been together with the architects uh, deeply in this uh, project. We will show some, some pictures later. We have also seen that in Houston you have uh, been part of the Museum of Fine Arts, together with Stephen Hall. And with Danish architects, I also came across uh, that activity in Boston, uh, it's uh, the campus for the engineers, the scientists, and the engineers of the Harvard University. So this is a little bit introduction into Roman Schieber, uh, who loves building physics, of course, and he had a great <laughs> lecturer on that one. Uh, but nevertheless, I mean, just watch out and see what he's presenting from Knippers Helwig. Yeah, thank you for having me. These two decades, that sounds a bit like I started my career with 12 years or so, but yeah, it's, it's okay. <laughs> So uh, think globally, build locally, that's the headline of this event today. So I'd like to share some of my experiences uh, with uh, projects across the world today. Um, that's the uh, international airport in Shenzhen. We designed uh, together with Massimiliano Fuxas. And uh, it's, it's not actually, it's not exactly correct, but with a European perspective, you can say the further you go, the bigger the projects get. And you can also say, 
that um, yeah, the faster, yeah, the further you go, the faster the construction actually goes. So this building is, it's not one kilometer, it's 1.6 kilometers long, but it's okay, <laughs> Werner, <laughs> no worries. Sorry. <laughs> but um, it, actually it was designed, engineered, and constructed within less than five years. And when I compare that with our um, um, Berlin airport, which was, I think it was actually eight years between a kind of completion and completion, so compared to that, it's really warp speed, I would say. <laughs> so, but I, I wanted to talk a bit about um, the local conditions you find uh, on site when you do such projects, because this is something you don't really see when you, uh, when you look at these high-profile architectural magazines, when you go on Instagram or when you go on these parametric design blogs or so. Um, you, you don't see such pictures, for example. I could show you a thousand pictures like that, but this is what really happens on site when you do such projects. I, 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 just, leave it, I just leave it there. <laughs> That's the same project. I think it's a couple of days before the grand opening of the airport terminal. And uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's an empty space, what's, what's quite amazing, because you will never see it empty again after it's uh, in operation. Um, it's a free-form building. It's uh, 65,000 uh, individual panels. Each, has a, each panel has a unique geometry. We wrote our own parametric software to generate the, so, uh, the, the geometry. We handed over the fabrication data to the fabricators, to the, to the contractors for fabrication. And um, so we designed it to a relatively high degree for a Chinese standard. But the same story here. So these are the pictures you, you finally find on site a, a picture I took on, on my own and uh, before the, the guy actually got angry because I took the picture. But uh, this is what, yeah, what you really find on site on, on such projects. The third and last example I have for you, this is the axis for the World Expo in, in Shanghai. We did, um, it's a one kilometer long uh, main axis and the interesting story here is that first we designed a steel glass canopy and uh, the client approached us and was like, oh, can you do it? Uh, can you make it look a bit cheaper? We have the Chinese pavilion next to it. And uh, maybe do a fabric roof or something like that. And I mean, it's, it was 10 years ago. We were a, a pretty small firm at that time. We basically had not much experience with, with tensile structures and fabric roofs. But we were like, yeah, fabric sounds great. Let's do that. That's a good idea. So we, we basically had not much experience, but, but we did one of the world's biggest uh, uh, membrane structures at that time. So it's, it's just ridiculous because in, in Germany, when you want to do a kindergarten, they don't let you build a kindergarten if you haven't built 10 kindergartens before. So that's the, the big difference between uh, yeah, Far East and in Germany. So that's one of my experience when you uh, do projects in, yeah, in China, for example. So, but yeah, I, of course, I also have a picture of the local conditions for you. So this is how uh, actually the scaffold has been put together to support see these six asymmetric steel glass funnels, just to yeah, support uh, the framing before things have been field welded together. Six different contractors for each of these steel glass funnels was also quite interesting. So you can basically build amazing projects anywhere on this planet. Um, frankly, you don't have so much influence on the local conditions you find on site, but you do have an impact and you can influence, um, in, in many cases, how you approach the project. When you talk early to the client, you can uh, discuss procurement strategies uh, and, and the project delivery methods. So. Um, there's many different examples, there's good and bad examples, and this is not an in-depth dis uh, uh, discussion or presentation about uh, procurement. But in general, you can, say, you can say that in Germany, you basically do a preliminary design, a detailed design, it's a prescriptive design. You go out on the market, you receive uh, uh, the proposals, and uh, the contractor is doing the a delegated design, means that they are... Uh, doing um, yeah, the, the, the final engineering uh, and they do the, the fabrication installation. To make it even more um, complicated, uh, there's European tender regulations that on public projects you are not even allowed to speak to the contractors, what might also be a reason why 
in some or in many projects in Germany or Euro Europe, uh, costs and time schedule is, is actually an issue. So um, you can say this is a kind of uh, German or central European approach. There's other examples as well. So this is basically more what we saw in, in, in China. You do a preliminary design. You don't, typically, typically, you don't go so far in the design. You throw it on the market. There's different contractors, by the way, the Chinese airport was built by six different facade contractors parallel at the same time, partially using different facade details. They took our geometry, didn't touch the geometry, they didn't touch the structure, but they worked with six different facade details on the exact same project. So it was more like avoiding the worst details on site when you do side visits, and so it was more like highlighting the problems and, and hope that they will revise a, a couple of things. But this is more the, the, yeah, the, the Chinese method. Uh, the third method, and what is quite interesting, and uh, I believe it's, it's not, not the worst idea, is uh, what is often used, for example, in the United States or in the UK, is when you, the design team, the architect, engineer, consult, consultant, is doing a preliminary design. There's a design assist phase, how they call it in the US, or a PSSA phase in the UK, where basically the contractors and the design team are sitting together for a certain time. They are discussing things, they are revising things together. Often there's a WE target that things are being simplified and the, the, the project is brought to budget. Uh, everybody will agree on a GMP, a guaranteed maximum price, and then um, the contractor is doing the delegated design, fabrication, and installation. There's also a couple of, there's some good things. The client often has yeah, a high level of um, confidence that the costs will work out and so on and so on. I personally think that at, especially on architecturally demanding projects, um, you often lose control over architecture because it's all about costs, it's all about time schedule, and um, you, you can, yeah, you lose control from time to time, especially if you have a bad contractor. And this happens too often, to be honest. So. Design Assist works great when you have a good contractor, and there's good examples for sure, yeah. So, but there's another um, method, and this is not very common, and this is what I wanted to talk about in more detail today, because we just did one project where we used this, this method. It's basically when you take away the delegated design from the contractor, and you as the facade consultant or engineer, you basically do everything from the concept sketch to the final design, final engineering, including engineer of record service, and don't let the contractor do the engineering. So you never give anyone else the control over the project, of, over, over the design. So there's a long story, but maybe I let, I, I rather uh, show the project to you. You can judge by yourself if you like it or not. So. This is the Academy Museum of Motion Pictures in Los Angeles, a project we just completed uh, together with Renzo Piano Building Workshop. Uh, basically, it's completed, will be open to public in April next year. Um, there's a, a larger master plan, there's this actual sphere building, there's the actual museum building here, there's the LACMA building over there, and a larger park landscape and a couple of things, but yeah, let's maybe sk skip that. Um, the main function of the building is actually, it's, the, the body is actually hosting this thousand seat theater um, where yeah, m movies and, and things will be presented and there's this uh, nice terrace up here with views over Hollywood Hills and there's three bridges partially suspended from each other linking the sphere building to the adjacent building would be a separate story. The building is, by the way, supported on some base isolators. There's 1.6 meter movement between the sphere building and the adjacent building and some uh, pop-up, glazed pop-up uh, expansion plates, what is uh, also quite interesting. But I will talk about the uh, glass dome, uh, what is uh, yeah, basically a curved canopy with 45 uh, meter in, in diameter. The story here was that uh, there was actually a, a previous design. There was already a contractor hired. Uh, they, they even built a mock-up. They actually had a, a space frame structure for, for the, the glass envelope. Long story short, it didn't work out. I think the cost and the architect was not happy. However, the entire team, except the design architect, was replaced. And uh, we came on board and uh, redesigned the whole thing. 
And it was, we, we, we had a history with, with Renzo Piano. We did the um, flagship store for the Pagan Kloppenburg with Renzo Piano in Cologne, or we did the projects like the Mitesal. So we had a lot of experience with these shelf structures where you can do incredible long spans with incredible small profiles, lightweight structures. So from day one, we basically promised that we would do it with a single layer shell structure. So um, these are the, the very first concept sketches. So we, we promised to Renzo Piano before, actually before we had the job, we promised to him that we would do it with, with four inch tubes, uh, 10 millimeters. And uh, finally we did it with, with 10 millimeter diameter tubes. We had 40 by 60 millimeter secondary tubes and we have these glass panes, secondary structure. Uh, that's, that's an early concept sketch. The, the S-build details look a bit different what you will see later, but basically we have this structure, we have a cable bracing, what makes it a stiff shell structure. Um, yeah, the, it's, it's pretty lightweight, so we have a, a steel tonnage of 40 kilograms per square meter for engineers. This is relatively good. It could even be better if we wouldn't have these openings, uh, that, but that's a separate story for architectural reasons. Um, we had these shingled glazing system, the glass is uh, not curved, it's two sides supported, it's only supported in this direction and it's basically non-supported on the other direction. Just a few words about the structural concept. We have, um, basically we have a, a, a steel grid, what is represented by the red lines. We have some diagonal members, what is basically providing vertical support to the structure and we have the horizontal pins, what is tying back the steel structure to the, uh, to the concrete uh, body. And we have a few bracing members for, for some reasons, but maybe that goes too far uh, into detail. We built our global structural models, what is basically a, a simplified version of the actual details. We had some yeah, models where we could simplify, you know, the, when you do light lightweight shell structures, you have to uh, yeah, work with relatively detailed models seismic wind and so on. So we had to yeah, design and engineer the, the cable forces, for example, under seismic, under wind, uh, check the utilization of the steel members and so on. So this is just homework for, for engineers. Um, yeah, also the deflection plots, for example, utilization of, of the members. Um, we had to do our detailed structural analysis just to give you an idea what was um, yeah, needed to design and engineer this project to uh, a certain degree. So relatively detailed analysis. Uh, we even designed the embeds and our scope of work included everything, including you know, the final weld seams and everything. So this is what you typically just hand over to the contractor and let that, that them do. So, but maybe a few things about details. So these are some physical models uh, Renzo Piano built. So when we first went to Genoa to the workshop and saw them for the first time, we were like, oh, what scale are these models? But they were really so, it's really tiny details. It's so small, all these details. So it was really a bit scary when we saw them for the first time. So everything is, is yeah, it's really, it's really small. Um, a, three, a couple of 3D diagrams on this slide and I think on the next one as well. And the S-built details where you see, yeah, just the, structural layer, the cable bracing layer, the secondary structure with the glass panes, and the little hidden dead load support what is carrying uh, the glass layer. There's actually much more details than you, than you may think. You think it's a sphere, there's not so many details, but there's a lot cable end details. There's you know, every single detail was designed with a lot of care together in a collaborative process with Renzo Piano. Um, embed design was also, it, it, it looks relatively simple. Actually, the concrete body is actually, it's a steel uh, primary structure. The, the concrete panels you see on this picture here is actually like a formwork with some shotcrete from inside. The embeds uh, have been positioned here and the second, the outer part of the embeds have been yeah, positioned in a second step uh, yeah, just to, to uh, adjust the tolerances while transferring the loads. There's a lot of re relatively complex geometry, as you can imagine when you look at these pictures or yeah, at the 2D drawing here. There's maintenance catwalks. Everything has a unique geometry and was, yeah, every detail is, is really designed with a lot of care. We had some 
maintenance stairs to access the dome. We have some operable vents up, here, up there. The architects call it Mohawk feature, so it's also an architectural element, of course. And yeah, some bracing members to st give stability to the, to the opening. Testing was a huge topic because when you do such things, it, it doesn't work without testing. Uh, so one thing we did was, um, in our structural analysis, we did a, a, a kind of, I mean, we, we checked various load cases and we found what the maximum rhombic distortion is. So we basically knew that in north-south direction, four node members may uh, deform by a maximum 22.3 millimeters, what is quite something when you work with 55 millimeter profiles. Uh, so we, we had to check these numbers. We built uh, a mock-up together with Gardner, who was the facade contractor. Here you see a little mock-up with some hydraulic checks where we just simulated the rhombic distortion. It's basically simulating a seismic event where the whole structure will deform. And uh, basically, as you can see here, that there's a quite a significant deformation of the glazing system, and we, we basically had to prove and also to convince the city of Los Angeles that uh, the system will still stay intact in such an uh, event. Yeah, that's some more tests. Um, I mean, it was actually designed to a relatively conservative um, standard. Um, I, I must say we have these two side supported glass, but it was partially the city of Los Angeles, partially also the client and ourselves. As, uh, when we act as the engineer of record, we're also responsible for a couple of things. So we agreed to basically design it uh, like a walkable glass surface. Uh, means uh, people will walk on the glass for maintenance and cleaning purposes. So we had a, a little heated chamber, as you can see here. Uh, we had we applied some some load. We simul basically we simulated a maintenance load case. We put some weights on the glass. We destroyed the first glass pane, the second glass pane, and just uh, yeah checked what happens uh, with a glass makeup. And interestingly, uh, when we passed the test, we added more weights and more weights until we couldn't fi find any more weights until the, everything just fall over. And even then, it didn't fall through the glass. So glass design is always conservative. <laughs> so yeah, maybe that, that we can make that quick. We also did some tests on the cable bracings. Just We had to make some assumptions which loads could be transferred through a cable clamp. And we had to confirm that through uh, some tests to verify that our early assumptions are uh, still correct. <clears throat> we did. Um, Normal visual mock-ups, uh, of course, we handed over geometry uh, information to Gartner um, for their fabrication uh, work. It was a very clear geometry system. Um, yeah, that's just a few images of fabrication. It was actually fabricated by Signum Steel in the Czech Republic. Um, and here, yeah, that gives a good impression what the system actually, how that actually worked. The steel structure was prefabricated at steel ladders that you don't have to assemble piece by piece on site, but it's, uh, as long as you get in an overseas container, everything had, has been prefabricated, gaskets and glazing system already installed. And this is where the coordination with the facade contractor Gardner started, that we, we is, were still responsible for the structural models and all that, and we are, we're started coordination, what is a prefabrication size, where can we make the joint, what are the forces at this, this point. So this was a cooperation basically during this execution uh, phase then. Yeah, just a couple of details, how you can access the bolts, the pre-stressed bolts in the, in the center of, of the tubes to connect uh, the prefabricated units uh, together. Embed installation was also relatively complex, but in the end of the day, you really have to uh, design and, and, think and engineer that step by step. Uh, it's a relatively complex uh, procedure. These are, yeah, that's not Germany anymore, what you can see from the palm trees in the blue sky. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that's, that's actually the first pieces which have been installed on the lower part, on the concrete body. And uh, yeah, that's just the, the planning of the upper part where um, the, the, yeah, the, the steel framing was installed on the lower part, the, the upper part was in the second step, and then uh, yeah, the, the magic happened where the, lower and the, the, the upper and the lower part basically had to match, and it worked better than, than we expected, to be honest. That 
was, was quite amazing. The installation concept and the pretension concept for the cables was one of the most complicated things on this project. This was really, really highly com uh, complicated and complex because when you start applying force in such a weak and lightweight system, you would immediately uh, distort such a structure. So it was absolutely important to install the cables and apply the forces in an absolutely symmetric way, what had been simulated cable by cable in our structural model. So, yeah, cable forces, we, we basically knew in it, between every single node, we knew what the force needs to be. So the deformation, there was a survey was actually also a super important thing on this uh, project. We, we had the, 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 geomet the geometry data um, when the sphere, uh, the, the steel grid was still on the scaffold. We had the information when the scaffold was released and the cables were already on. And we had the information from our structural model. We knew that uh, what the predicted uh, deflection should be when the scaffold was taken away. And it was uh, actually quite amazing that it was almost exactly what we predicted between uh, design and, and what we found uh, on site. So just a few pictures uh, of the glass. Glass was done by Eckelt in Austria, Gartner on the sticker. So um, also the installation of glass. You must, maybe it's, it's also interesting to know that the glass is heavier than the steel structure and the secondary structure. So the installation of glass was also quite important. So it was also a, a plan developed together with, uh, with Gartner that it was also installed in a very symmetric way, basically going down in circles from the center. And uh, that was, I, I was on site and I, I found some of these cables when they just started with the installation. I found that some of the cables were slack and I was really so scared what's going on there. But actually it, it had to be like that because um, yeah, it, it's, it's just very heavy and it just deforms and cables are getting slack. But we predicted then when you keep going with installation, finally it will be fine in the end of the day. This is, by the way, also quite interesting because we were only supporting one of both glass plies. So the outer glass pane is only supported through its inner layer. It's a structural PVB inner layer. So we had operable winds. There was also some climate analysis done by Transolar. Shading was a huge topic, but that's maybe a separate, uh, would be a separate story. Uh, comfort analysis, we finally ended up with some shades by Draper. There was a, a shading mock-up and things like that. So this is basically the end result with these shades, which can be uh, operated. And a couple of pictures of almost the end result. It's yeah, a couple of months old. It's done now. And a few pictures of the, uh, yeah, the completed project. Still some tools up there on the terrace. A picture from the top. And uh, yeah, basically that's it. Basi there's actually there's an antenna feature still missing, what will be added and in uh, April it will open to public. Thank you very much for your attention. So we are live in the studio with not many people. Roman, thank you so much. Normally we clap hands together. I, I don't know why we don't do it, but it's... <laughs> <laughs> We, we should you. just try to get a little bit normal life back in, into our daily business. Thanks a lot. I mean, it was, it was some super pleasure. interesting uh, structural engineering things. I, I will have a question for the talk later on on the u value of the glass roof, but we will talk about this a little bit later on. But it was oh, really extraordinary. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, thank you so much. It has been yeah. a pleasure. And uh, just stay in. I mean, it's just three more remaining. I just have seen Professor Blandini just joined us, so he will also talk about the Werner Sobek activities here. Lisa Ramming is just the warming up for her speech. And in between, we have another person who will also be broadcasted. It is uh, Tor Christian Müglebüst. He is part of uh, the Dark Architecture uh, team in Oslo. Um, Dark Architecture is one of the fastest growing Norwegian architect's offices. And in these circumstances, uh, the partner, Tor Christian, will give us a speech on various activities. And I've also Googled a little bit what Dark Architect is all about, and a little bit the combination of what you will see today. Dark Architects are urban planners. Dark Architects are, in addition, landscape architects. 
and they also dedicate their work, you will see it later on, from the smallest residential home till the complex high-rise building. And I just have three remarkable projects on my list, just to mention what is about dark architecture to get a picture on that one. The first one I would just like to give you is the barcode district. Whoever was in Oslo so far, when you enter the main railway station, you have a barcode-shaped high-rise, middle-rise buildings there. And it has a meaning. Furthermore, the second project I really came across is the DNB, the Norske Bank in Oslo. Together with MV, DRV, they have designed this kind of, I would say, iconic project and building. And what is really, really fantastic is that the theme of this building, it is called thematic pixelation. And when you Google it, DNB Bank in Oslo, you will realize why it's called the thematic pixelation. And Tor Christian will dedicate his speech of about 20 minutes also um, in a video stream from Oslo. He will dedicate it to a project where also we have been luckily involved from the Vicona side. It's called, we don't know what, how is it pronounced in Norwegian correctly. We call it Ocon, Ocon Portal. I found another word, but I don't trust that my Norwegian is as good as my German. So... Let's share together with Tor Christian his experience about the Ocon portal. And you see it's a combination of urban planning, of building architecture and landscape architecture in totality. Enjoy. Hi, I'm Tor Christian Möglebust, one of eight partners uh, of Dark Architect. I have also been uh, the main project leader uh, for the last two and a half years for uh, one of our most significant projects, Öken Portal, which has uh, caught quite some attention recently due to its uh, size and the, what it contains of uh, facilities. Dark Architect uh, was originally established in 1988 as a small architecture practice. It has since then developed into today's uh, office of about 75 skilled architects. Dark Architect is also part of the Dark Design Group, which consists of six different divisions um, with mostly architects, but also landscape architects and interior architects. We, Dark Architecte, has a wide uh, range of projects in our portfolio, um, spanning from uh, large-scale uh, urban planning projects down to smaller, let's say, single-house projects for uh, families and even down to um, uh, product uh, design and furniture. We have, during the uh, latest years, focused more and more on sustainability in our work. Uh, Dark Architect was actually taking part in introducing the BREEM tool uh, in Norway some years ago. Öken Portal. A brief history. The area used to be a grey industrial area uh, where there was a lot of traffic. It was in between uh, very busy roads. Our client, Oslo Pensionsforsikring, had uh, a property there they wanted to develop. They had a vision to create a sustainable community between business and the local neighborhood. And with that uh, as a basis, they uh, invited Dark Architecte, among others, to compete in an architecture competition um, in order to develop their um, property into becoming a sustainable uh, building complex in a new sustainable part of Oslo. 
The name Erken Portal derives from the shape of the building. It is a U-shaped main volume, which is built like a bridge structure over the ground, forming a portal from the east into the central outdoor area of the project. The portal is visible from, from far away and you intuitively know where to go when you approach the building. And once you reach the portal, uh, where we have the, what, we, what we refer to as the portal plaza, you intu intuitively also are led into the main entrance of the complex. The main volume uh, contains about 3,000 office workplaces connected to the central pavilion that contains an information desk uh, at two levels, plan one, coming from uh, the east the, in this direction, and on plan three, if you arrive from the west. The uh, pavilion has about a thousand seats of dining facilities, which will be open to the public as well as serving as lunch facilities and so forth for the office workers. The architectural concept was actually inspired by the forests around Oslo. Oslo is known to be a green capital surrounded by forests. The forests around Oslo has inspired the architecture. The tree trunks of the forest can be compared to the, the columns that is carrying the building and the activities in the building. You have the branches reaching for the sky and leaves in between the structure, providing solar shading and protection for the building's inhabitants. And in between, you have, you have clearings that provides more daylight into the building and also better views from the inside to the outside world. From the beginning, we started out uh, with three 3D models uh, examining the facades and the elements of the facades. Here you see a section of, uh, of the elements uh, containing uh, the, uh, the trunks and the, the leaves providing shelter and solar shading. In this case, you have solar shading uh, in front of the glass, but that will automatically disappear under, behind the leaf panels. Here you see a uh, part of the facade where we have a typical uh, facade atrium, which provides daylight and views out to the outside world from the, the office workplaces. We were quite happy when we heard that City Carl 75 was chosen as the main material of the facades. As it added uh, a sustainable detailing to a building that had high ambitions on sustainability. The facade elements have been delivered from the facade uh, contractor, Staticus. And uh, some, some fun facts about this, uh, this uh, facade is that it, uh, it has about 1,600 uh, elements delivered to site. It's, um, it covers an area of about 14,500 square meters. And the, uh, the profiles make up about 30 kilometers profile.
The building is under completion at the moment. This is a picture from September 2020 showing status at that point. The, um, the first part of the building uh, will be ready for handover on December 1st. I, that is actually today when you see this. Um, it will be handed over to Telia, uh, which is one of the major telecommunications in Scandinavia. And we are incredibly proud of the result. And we are quite sure that they will be quite satisfied what we have provided for them. And we do hope that we have given them even more than they were expected, expecting. Uh, you can see here in the facades, the main elements, the, uh, the load uh, carrying elements, the trunks. You have the leaves for protection, solar protection, in between the branches. And here you see the, the main volume uh, over uh, the portal plaza forming this portal building, which wel welcomes you when you arrive from the east. We are incredibly proud of the result. <clears throat> and it's, uh, it's been a challenging two and a half years. But when we see the result, we think it's well worth the effort seeing that the, the actual the, the concept has been uh, carried out in reality like this. And with that, I will leave the word to my colleague Sindre Andersen Gosvik, who will say a few words about the green features of the project. Thank you for your attention. Hello, my name is Sindre Andersen Gosvik, and I'm an architect at Dark Architecture. On Økern Portal, I have been a team leader with responsibility for the building envelope and for the exterior architecture. And now, I'm looking forward to giving you a presentation of the rooftop park of Økern Portal. In addition to selecting our winning proposal for the facade concept, the client, OPF, also shared our vision of giving something back to the local community. So for this project, we have designed a park that covers the entire roof of the building and most of it will be accessible to the public. The roof consists of two terraces, one accessible for the public and one for the tenants renting office space in the building. And between them runs more than 5,000 square meters of landscape park. That means the park is massive and it's now recognized as the largest of its kind in Northern Europe. Actually, when you consider all the area of the roof is landscape, and include the area in the public space underneath the portal of the building, we have actually increased the potential for green area on the site compared to the previous situation. Together with our sister company, Lark Landskap, and the main contractor, we have been working intensively with populating this park with lots of sustainable features. From biodiverse vegetation, to viewpoints, a running track, beehives, agricultural plots, and allotment gardens. From a technical point of view, the roof is actually quite impressive. In Norway, we have a climatic situation where you can have frost in the ground. The surface is uh, completely ice and not uh, permeable, but then you get sudden downpours of rain. So that meant we had to take care of the water flow from the highest point of the building and all the way down as it's sloping down towards its surrounding, not only on the constructive roof underneath, but also on the surface of the park. On this picture, you can also see how the park will have magnificent views of the city. From here, you would be able to see the entire city of Oslo. To the south, we have the fjord and the harbor area. And in the other direction, you would have the grand forest and the hills behind the city. The rooftop park of Ökern Portal have been a main focal point and also a selling point in order to get tenants to the project. So every decision made by the client, the contractor and us as designers have been geared towards really making this a lush and functional park. Everything grown here is edible and is providing extremely local vegetal to the food courts in the pavilion on the ground. That means that uh, the tenants renting office space in the building, as well as the local community, can come and have lunch or dinner in the afternoon and get a proper taste of the roof. This picture is from a recent site inspection when I was up there in September. As you can see, the tartan layer of the running track was not yet in place, 
But still, I could envision running up along the edge, looking down towards the pavilion and up towards the high point of the building. <clears throat> the steep here is actually 10% uh, degrees, which is quite decent. So I can imagine that this will be the subject of many intense Strava battles in the years to come. Being up there, uh, I was uh, contemplating what an experience it has been to work on a project like this. And I felt very proud and also relieved to see how far along the park has come at this moment. And I can't wait to see it in full blossom come next summer. Again, I can imagine being an office worker in this building. And uh, if you're working long hours, like we have, even if you are surrounded by great interiors and the modern solution that this building will have, it must be such a rush coming up on the roof after hours. And uh, you have magnificent views, maybe you have something nice to drink, you're 10 stories above the ground, but still you're in a park surrounded by natural elements. I think that must be a, must be a very nice situation. Yeah, this uh, picture is taken in the other direction. And what I really like is how the park seems to connect with the forest behind it just going on and on like an infinity park. It was, a, it was a sunny day when we were up there, so my colleague Henrik and I, we decided to bring out the drone and uh, film the facade and the rooftop park of Ökarn Portal from the air. And now, to conclude this presentation, we will uh, show you that film. Thank you. Thank you, Tor Christian, and all the best uh, in Oslo. And just for today, I mean, they are not able to join us later on when we go for the discussion together with the team here. Dark Architect, Tor Christian, today they do the inauguration of Ocon Portal. So this is one of the very, very most important days, at least also for us, because we as Vicona, we have been invited together with our customer Staticus from the Baltics to support. And here we have really made, uh, I would say, one step further when it comes to CO2 reduction in materiality. We have used here the Hydro Circal 75R aluminium. And this is something which is really supporting the strife of the architects to have this kind of extreme uh, green, extreme supportive for the environment and the location um, design and landscape architecture. And uh, Professor Blandini, maybe you just join in. Um, it, it's also a pretty interesting CV. Um, you have Italian roots. You studied civil engineering at the Bologna University. You also have architectural degree. You went to US uh, to finish the studies there. And in addition, you did at uh, the Leitwig Institute of uh, Design and Construction in Stuttgart, you did uh, your PhD. And uh, I, I would say the Institute for Leitwig Design and Construction, I mean, for all those uh, Outside, you know exactly who is it. He is now heading this institute, which is very famous. You're the straight successor at the moment, together with Werner der Sobeck and Mr. Novak. But those of you out there who know Otto, Frei Otto, who know more or less all these uh, colleagues from Schleich, um, they have a, a clear understanding what kind of responsibility in this uh, ELEC is now on your shoulders. And, and I just remind myself for a famous PhD theme you have done, it is called more or less the Stuttgart Glass Schale. So it's uh, the Stuttgart Glass Bowl. And if you just look at it, it's a half dome of glass with nothing more than glass and I would say an adhesive in between. So it, it's, it's really almost self-standing in itself. It's, it's really fantastic to watch out and to see these things like that. And also here, we have uh, just spoken about some projects of uh, Werner Sobek AG. Engineering is on their topic, but also designers. Um, you do everything from chair designs, I've learned myself, for 
airports uh, until more or less supporting the architects worldwide. For instance, the Baku Flame Tower is part of the activity of Van der Sobeck's uh, right. work, and a lot of more in these uh, perspectives. And it's uh, pretty nice to have you here and looking forward to your speech and to your talk. Enjoy. This is the session of Professor Blandini. So, thanks for the introduction. Uh, I'm very glad uh, to be here, even if in a small group, but I know there are plenty of people on the other side, and this is very nice. Uh, I will start with, uh, I will do a, a small um, word travel, uh, because uh, uh, as it was said at the beginning, I was traveling a lot in the past, so every time that there was a funny project outside of Germany, I was the one uh, jumping into the flight and, uh, and taking this challenge. So I would like to show some of the projects I've been working on. And uh, bear with me, uh, since I'm coming from Italy, I would like to start with the Ferrari Museum. Just, not just because it is Ferrari and it's Italy, but also because uh, a lot of the um, issues and a lot of the philosophy and the way of working we've been uh, developing over several years at Werner Sobeck have, uh, in a way, can be already seen here, even if this project is 12 years, more than 12 years old. Um, and the point was about making complex, sophisticated engineering, but making it in such a way that it's easy to be built, to be assembled. And we like, we've been listening before about different model of collaboration, different processes, and uh, I have to say, we like to work um, on all different sides. We like to work with architects. We like to work with the contractors. And uh, jumping back and forth between this way of working, it's, it has been helping a lot, uh, building up our knowledge. So if you look just at this example of a glass clamp, it's a very small detail. It has been taking more than... Um, in a couple of months to develop it. And the nice thing about that is that this model that you can see in, uh, in Rhino, it was 12 years ago, it has been used one-to-one -one for casting directly in Italy. So that was uh, already one uh, approach to uh, file to fabrication, if you want, which is a word that is used a lot nowadays but could be, uh, could be already used uh, several years ago. And um, just moving further, to make this envelope, this aluminum envelope possible, and uh, just for the information, it's 45 meters wide, it's 75 meters uh, uh, long, and there is no expansion joints at all. So that was a challenge to make this shape possible. And uh, at that time, 12 years ago, we were scripting in uh, AutoCAD and made possible to have profiles giving the shape and uh, parametrically built generated holes. And I would like to stress the word parametric because at the end of the day, I will show how this is um, now used in one of my recent projects, the Kuwait International Airport. So there is a path joining all of these projects over the last years. And... Um, for people working on complex geometry, uh, there is always the, uh, the joke about the Pareto rule. So the smallest part are always the most complex parts. Part. So 20% of the surface here, there were these small skylights. It was 80% of the work because we had to define the geometry of this small cladding piece to make this possible. And I also like to show um, pictures from, uh, we've been seeing in, uh, in the other presentation, pictures from the site, um, how this uh, aluminum element get bent on position on site. The installation is um, pretty easy and simple because the uh, prefabrication, because the preparation of the elements is very sophisticated and directly driven by the uh, computers with engineering understanding and with engineering knowledge. So this is the appearance. It is uh, the way that the museum is facing the house where Enzo Ferrari is born. It's, it's a nice combination of old style and new style, but it's also a nice view how machine, automotive, sport design can match with architecture. 
I will go very quickly through a couple of other projects around the world. Here we are in Mansueto just to show the different models of collaboration that I've been experiencing over time. Here a project with Murphy and Jan, with Helmut Jan in, uh, in Chicago, and working with the architect during the first part of the, uh, of the work and then supervising the contractor later on, it has been demonstrated to be a very successful um, way of cooperating. Because then with Sele as a facade contractor, we were here able to achieve maximum level of precision in the fabrication. So our target in this case was not to show any bolted connection at all together with the architects. And um, what we managed together to do together with Sele was to have just less than a millimeter joint uh, on these nodes. Again, the nodes themselves, they are very um, sophisticated in terms of they change the angles in different conditions. Uh, the connections, which is inside uh, these hollow steel profiles, is varies from uh, zone to zone. Um, but at the end of the day, it is a very clean architecture. It is very precise, and uh, and I believe it's uh, it's a nice environment for people to to study. It's it's a university library. Let's move farther from uh, Chicago to Tokyo. Actually, at that time, I was traveling around uh, myself. That was not only about the projects. I was uh, in Tokyo a couple of days later. I was in, in Chicago. It was a funny and challenging time, and these were part of the uh, output of it. And here, working with Elmut Jan, the challenge was to achieve maximum transparency in a high rise, which is 200 meter high. And we are in Tokyo, that means tornado, that means earthquakes. Uh, that means that the engineer uh, in me was challenged to make that structure as filigree as possible in order not to, uh, um, to destroy this, this wish for, for transparency. And here you can see uh, on the, on the uh, white part, the engineering process and the detailing work, and then what it has been built. And in this case, in Japan, it was not possible for us to keep full control of the uh, construction process. So if you would ask me, then I would tell you exactly there, there are a couple of bits and parts where I would have liked to bring the last uh, level of quality, and this is what it is possible when you are uh, when you follow the whole chain until uh, construction. This is why I like to be involved in the, into the construction process. Now let's uh, skip back to, um, to Europe, to Brussels, the Museum of European History. It's uh, an extension of an existing building. We've been uh, winning the competition together with, with the architects, Czechs and Morel in Paris, um, with the idea of having a, a, a sustainable but transparent facade on top of the existing masonry building. And the way to achieve that was to uh, mix and integrate together what is structure, what is facade, what is architecture. Uh, at the end of the day, the architects, uh, and it was the architects that were saying, you cannot distinguish anymore what it is architecture, what it is engineering. It has been a teamwork. Um, that uh, is, has been paying off. It has received an award uh, done a couple of months ago, the German Design Award. Um, and it is uh, sustainable just because there is one surface carrying the loads, one surface bringing the um, protection from the weather. And um, also the, uh, the stripes that you can see are part of it's, it's an architectural device, of course. They are recalling the color of the measuring, but it's also a, um, a functional device because it's diminishing the level of energy that is coming inside. And this is what I like uh, when you get this team spirit and when you get the chance to collaborate with a contractor. So we, in this case, we've been following the overall chain from competition to construction and we had to push the contractor a lot in order to achieve the quality we wanted, but it uh, worked out at the end, and I think the result is, uh, is speaking for itself. And interesting enough, the same detailing, the same way of thinking has been done 
shifted and translated into a different region, into Middle East. Here we've been asked to have inclined fin. We thought, okay, we can use a similar detailing, the way the fins and the glass are connected. What I didn't say before in Brussels is that the glass is also bracing the overall area, so that it means that it's used in a structural way. And the same thing we did it here. Here it was even more needed uh, because the fins are inclined. So the glass has to bear in a way the fin. Um, and there is a reason to have this, uh, this inclination because this museum is celebrating the uh, area where the UAE have been founded. And you can imagine the seven emirs signing and uh, when you sign, then you have a certain inclination done of your pen. And this is symbolically what the architects want to recall here. And this has been a challenging for us as a consultant in order to make this uh, possible. But in this case, in, uh, uh, we didn't get the chance to follow up during the construction. Everything was three times quicker and faster than it was in Europe. Uh, but uh, I'm not going to show the detail level because this is another different, it has another quality than what I showed before. So you can see as the way our engineers, depending on the constellation where they are working, uh, bring to different results. And still it's, a, it's, it's an amazing architecture. I mean, it's, uh, it's a nice, we've been doing a simulation in order to make this transparency possible. You can see on, on the bottom of the presentation in order to uh, get a control amount of light and an energy inside. Moving back to Europe, uh, it's a traveling back and forth. I think, uh, bear with me for a second. Um, this is a, uh, an insurance building. It is a retrofit. I believe this is something that is coming more and more um, because we have holder structures and we've been listening about circular economy. So to me, circular economy and, and sustainable approach means also if you have a structure that is still working, keep it there and uh, change the parts that need to be changed. And this is what has been done here. So we, we uh, brought a new facade, a double scheme facade here, with the idea of having a transparent surface, but we also, of course, with the need to have a ventilation of the cavity. And uh, usually you see this kind of facades with horizontal stripes. You have the hair coming, uh, coming in and getting out. And the architects told us, uh, we don't want that. We want something different. We want to stress on verticality. So we've been pushing uh, in terms of uh, making studies and making sophisticated studies how the hair can get inside uh, can get from the bottom, but also from the sides. The sides are perforated, so these holes are diminishing the, um, the weight of the system by allowing for, for a ventilation, and they are not constant at the end as they have been uh, shown in the sketch uh, from the architects, so they've been engineered in a way that it, it's performing well. So back into uh, Middle East, I will now go a little bit more in detail into these two projects. The Wazel Tower in Dubai, which is currently under construction, uh, has been designed together with you in studio. And here the idea was to have um, a new, iconic, sustainable architecture in the Middle East. So if you go to Dubai, you have this typical uh, darker uh, glasses, uh, very reflecting, very shiny. Uh, you have, or you have opaque areas, and we wanted here to, together with the architects, to have a, a different approach to that and allow for more um, neutral glasses to be adopted. And wherever we have opaque areas, to uh, use those to uh, as a as a f as fin to shadow the system, and uh, we decided to have two main features. The one is to, and this is actually pretty, a pretty classic way of working, uh, the one is to uh, have more glass areas in the north, uh, on the north uh, side, which is, by the way, the seaside, so you open the view to the, to the outside, and uh, more opaque part on the south side. This was the first move. The second move was to set fins 
Um, in uh, uh, following the geometry, the geometry is a torso, so as the Italian says, um, so it's a twisted, uh, it's like a twisted body that uh, symbolically recall the uh, fact that this high-rise is part of, the, uh, of a very relevant traffic node. The Burj Khalifa is just, uh, um, just next to it, and there is a, a highway crossing there, and this twisting is in a way also showing how this infrastructure that you can see then on the ground is mirrored in the, um, in the high-rise. And in order to allow for that, we have uh, developed a staggered facade, as you can see on the picture. And uh, we've been selecting different regions of the facade. So we have, of course, certain areas that, because of this twisting effect, are uh, geometrically challenging. And um, we've been developing that in a, in a very special way with uh, the support of different scripts and with the idea that this area, in this area, this element, they are not bended, but they are come, the, the glasses are uh, coming out of the plane in a way, so that we have certain conditions, as you can see on the, on the, section, uh, on the section below. And actually, this part is already under construction in, uh, in Dubai, and there's a next step. Um, the ceramic fins will be installed, uh, we wanted to have, together with the architects, to have ceramic for this uh, for these fins, because it's uh, it's a material, it's a mineral material, it's a material that has a big tradition in the Arabic world, and um, it's a material that can brings a, a life touch to the facade. So it's not uh, not cold. Um, this is what you see is the first mock-up. We still are making some fine tuning on the coloring of the. Um, of the fins, but I remember the architects uh, went to a shop and bought some very fancy shoes uh, with, with, a, with a shiny changing color, and they say, okay, see that? This is what I, we want to achieve with, a, uh, with our ceramic elements, so let's push for that to happen, and this is the kind of lively character that we want to achieve in the skin, and I'm sure it's going to come then. Last but not least, uh, the project that has been keeping me busy for more than four years before I moved back to the, uh, to the university, the Kuwait International Airport. And interesting enough, uh, you can see here, 12 years later, a lot of the principle that I was showing at the beginning with a, with a Ferrari. Um, of course, the architecture is now developed since then. So here, uh, it's a geometry, it's an architectural project from uh, Foster and Partners, it was completely parametric and for us and for me and my team uh, working with parametric is, uh, is a key to keep control and to allow for a lot of diversity within the architecture is bringing variability to that but in a controlled way and I like to do that. So we built our model, our BIM model, our fabrication models all in a parametric way and we've been working for the contractor here. Uh, so taking over after the, um, the bid packages and developing all the system in order to get uh, this complexity, the facade, is also is not only geometrically complex. Every element is different because it's parametrically uh, changing geometry. It has to withstand uh, also here huge loads, uh, blast loads in certain areas, and and the, the challenge here was not to notice the difference where the blast is is coming. So that means that the profiles actually are looking the same. And what it seems a very logic way of thinking for us as an engineer was a pretty challenge. And um, actually, I hope that it will be possible to be seen. And once again, it is uh, what you can see here. It's um, a facade that allows for a lot of light to get inside. The glass is a selective glass. It's a selective factor for more than two which is um, pretty good actually for, for these areas. And uh, you get light also from the roof with skylight system. So you will have, depending on the sun position, a, a nice game of light as you can already see on site. 
I think one or two years, I'm not going to recall the, the Berlin uh, comparison, but uh, I was in Berlin then uh, and I, I was not understanding why it took so long, uh, why we've been planning that for four years, or maybe I understand that, but it's another story. Um, and here you see such a degree of complexity and, um, and you keep control of that with people uh, when we were sitting around at the table and uh, here the, um, the, the relationship between the different people plays a very important role. So you sit 30 people around, around the table, you have people from Spain, people from Germany, people from Turkey, people from uh, local people from Kuwait, you have people coming with different cultures, with different backgrounds, and, um, and the only way to master such projects is that you get a level of uh, personal understanding that uh, you can face this challenge and even if, and it becomes harsh sometimes, uh, but that was our experience, if there is a common trust that problems can get solved then and if people are willing to work together then you can manage to get this complexity. Um, not only designed, which is the first level, but also built, which is the second level. And to me, it's uh, is very important not to get a nice design on the paper, but to see the quality actually in the built condition. So, at the end, uh, let me just, uh, since I'm back at the university after uh, several years of full praxis immersion, let me just show a couple of the thoughts that I'm bringing from the praxis back into the research work. Uh, because in a way they are influenced by the um, experience that I done over the last years. The first uh, is our research focus on digital tools. Uh, here we started a collaboration, a research project, project together with Sele and with uh, several other partners from different uh, fields in order to make this communication between design and fabrication uh, much simpler and much quicker. Um, and what we have experienced over time is the fact that uh, in the past, depending on if you are working before this, uh, the, the bid packages goes out or after that, it's like a clear cut. It has some advantages, we, I think we are all aware about that, but it means that there is a lot of work that gets lost. There is a lot of information that in this cut moment gets lost and this is really a pity. And there are contractual aspects to that. Uh, we could discuss, I believe, for hours about the all issues linked to that. But actually, if you think that the time that gets lost in this, in this step is money, and is money that could be valuable to be used in other ways, then I think we should put a little bit more of effort to change this way of thinking. And that is, at the end, what it would bring to more quality, in my mind, for less cost and with more time uh, precision than in the future. So we are sticking with, with this uh, way of working, been working two years and I think we will further work on this because I believe that digital tools can help a lot uh, in uh, addressing much better the interface between the different partners. And uh, last but not least, I've started since uh, more than half a year working on the um, on an adaptivity project, it's here, it's about uh, structure and facade. And the thinking is, we are in a dynamic world and actually our built environment is still too static for that. And it is not allowing by, uh, by this way of approaching, uh, it's not allowing to have a correct use of resources, it's not allowing to have a proper uh, relationship between user and architecture just because it's too static. So um, there are already uh, several ways of approaching that and we as a university we are looking into uh, further ways collaborating with uh, people coming from uh, automotive industry, there are people working on configurators uh, as it is typical in the automotive industry, we've been listening to that before. Um, as well as people coming from uh, aerospace industry. And interestingly enough, this um, 
the system that uh, that has been moving in the uh, on on the presentation has been uh, developed on the basis of a NASA project. So the f the way the folding is working, it's actually a transfer. And of course, when you transfer things, you have to adapt it to different performances. You have to. Uh, change several things, but there's a lot that we can learn from other fields and actually this is a whole lesson from uh, Fray Otto and from a lot of people coming from Stuttgart um, and this is a lesson that I uh, make minds already over the last years and I would like to push forward. So here another use, possible use with liquid crystal facade uh, uh, in order to, to react in a better way and to allow for more transparency. So then we don't have a fixed selective value, we, we just have a movable target in a way. I think this is the future and uh, we will keep working on this. We've been awarded uh, new funding for the coming four years, so I will put a lot of our, my and our energies to get new results and eventually show next time a bit more of what has been happening done on this field. So I'm now at the end of my presentation. On one side, I'm showing a project in Dubai, which is going to be completed uh, next year. And on the other side, I'm actually showing the demonstrator iRise building, which is going to um, validate and demonstrate all the facade system. At the moment, you see the uh, staircase. In a week or two, we will start with a steel, and next year we will mount different facade system, and we will show what it is already possible nowadays with a little bit of creativity. Thanks. Professor Blandini, thank you so much for that speech, and uh, I just was uh, a little bit thinking about the question I should uh, just uh, give to you. Um, we have to seem that we have to think globally and we build locally. Um, what was the most demanding building project? You have been a fundamental part of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I think that the most demanding one was in the, uh, indeed the, the Kuwait project. Mm -hmm. Because of the sheer size, uh, I didn't mention to that, but even here we have a site of 1.2 kilometers and uh, the diversity of that, but it would be just one point. And the other part was uh, the necessity to use very sophisticated digital tools to make that possible as mm -hmm. a planner. And on the other side, uh, convincing contractor that were more uh, traditional and a client which was more interested in the result, that we need, and this is typical when you use these tools, you have to make a lot of development work at the beginning. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, you don't see results. You just uh, see that there is something going on. But then it's well invested time because in the second part mm -hmm. of the process, then you can show that every time that the site has an issue, that the client uh, has a, a logistic yeah. issue, then everything goes very quick. Mm -hmm. So at the moment it was hard to convince all these different parties to, to, to bear with us and there were contractual issues linked to that. Yeah. Uh, and at the end they were very happy and I was calling with them, uh, I'm still partially involved into, into the project and I was calling with them today and they told me, uh, you know what, actually we need you further and uh, would you like to, to support us further? And this is actually what it motivates uh, to... Rewarding to stick with, yeah. this, with this philosophy. That's great. Thank you so much. And maybe because we will not go into discussion now, because I mean, it's uh, two hours and a half. It has been five extremely interesting presentations. But nevertheless, I would love uh, Roman to come back on stage and Lisa. And uh, Professor Blandini, maybe you just join that one. And Lisa, just join me on that side. Um, we will not go for a discussion, but I, I just was also flipping a little bit aside with, during the presentations and, and something was pretty remarkable from Lisa. She said, I'm afraid that we might be a little bit true traditional in some areas. So the question for every one of you and you might answer one after the other is, Monday morning, 7 a.m., what thrills you to wake up and to go to work and to make the next construction business successful? Roman? So Monday morning, 7 a.m., 
first of all, I have to deal with my kids. So that's the first thing I, ha I have to deal with. But it's it's really the the architectural challenging projects what what gives me uh, the yeah the power to wake up to go to the office and um, t just every project is different and uh, the, the challenges is what makes our job interesting in the end of the day. So you could also say that the problems coming uh, with a with a job with the facades and yeah, that makes it interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not an easy project would not be as interesting as a complicated one. Okay, in so a way. the engineering part is the most thrilling one. And, and the building physics, I guess, or? Uh. <laughs> 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 what was the difference between U-value, G-value? Uh, it's Ask me. almost the same. <laughs> uh, next question goes to Lisa. <laughs> Let me think about that. So for me, I think it's not so much even thinking about projects, it's much more about, I get excited about change. I get excited about the idea of making an impact in my own very little bubble and this little bubble that our industry is and perhaps trying to extend that industry um, or the borders of that industry trying to borrow from other industries and I think mm -hmm using that on whatever project um, someone gets excited about involving us is really what, you know, makes me excited about my work. Thank you, Lisa. And uh, from my side, I mean, what it is exciting is uh, to be able to build in such different conditions, mm -hmm. to react to such different challenges and um, there is there is a continuity between the different projects, but there is every project is something in itself, and skins are are uh, like uh, like a visit card, like a business mm -hmm. card. So it's there is a lot of identity to it. There is a lot of emotion to that, but they should also perform in a proper way, and that means that uh, you have a lot of variety. You have a lot of different. Uh, performances that have to fit all into that and solving this within different cultures uh, actually it's amazing it's an it's an amazing experience and there is a part is technical and a part is cultural and this is uh, what mm -hmm. uh, what I like and now that I'm back to the university what I'm also enjoying a lot is the energy that the younger generation mm -hmm. are bringing there is this will of um, of a of a different way of building, which which I really mm. uh, enjoy, and uh, and people are motivated to work 12 hours a day just to give their contribution. And uh, being able to lead this team now, it's uh, it's also making me uh, easier to to wake up in the morning on Monday. A rewarding part, at least. Yeah. So the audience, thanks a lot out there. Uh, it was a pleasure to host you here from our next studio from Frankfurt. If you want to stay tuned, just follow the next studio on LinkedIn because the next facade session will be March 25th, hopefully with uh, more people in here. Also, when it comes to these international topics, I mean, this one was something which was, at least from the headline, a little bit uh, demanding. Think globally, build locally. But I'm so super happy to have you all here, here in the studio, Professor Blandini from Werner Sobeck AG, Lisa from Eckers Leo Callahan, Roman Schieber from Knippers and Helwig. Thanks to Christoph Tim from SOM in New York. And of course, finally, it is Tor Christian from Dark Architecture in Oslo. Thank you for joining us and looking forward to see you soon again. And now it's time to clap hands and say, have a nice evening. Discover next. The studio for facades and design. Next is the platform for innovation in the field of building envelopes, for inspiration, information, and communication. Initiated by Vicona, with leading industry experts as next partners. Next is a unique concept which is constantly evolving and bringing the future of cities to life.